Today, I'm in another Rover. I hope you enjoy this one, because I certainly am. If you haven't already hit like and subscribe, then please think about doing that. It makes a massive difference to the channel. Thank you. Dogs. By the mid 1980s, it was clear to the Rover group that the Montego was gonna start looking a bit old hat come the early 90s. So they started thinking about a replacement. Now initially their thinking was, we haven't got much money, let's cut down a Rover 800. And so Roy Axis Design Studio set about designing the AR16 and AR17, which was a hatchback and saloon version of a shortened Rover 800. However, when the new big boss Graham Day turned up on the scene, he kind of realized that Rover didn't have any money even to do a cut down version of an 800. So long-term partner Honda came to the rescue with Project Synchro. So a new plan was hatched. Honda would lead the way with the main structure of the car and Rover would come in and style it. And following the Honda way, the new cars, the SK1, Honda, SK2, Rover, would be based around the same platform and both manufacturers would then get the benefit of the other's expertise in creating a new compact executive car, the Rover 600. With Honda focusing on the substructure and the hard points, designer Richard Woolley and his team headed out to Japan to work with the Japanese team to create the exterior skin of the car. Both companies had different directions to go and both had their own criteria to meet, but both teams' result had to fit to the same basic thing. And you'll find that common to both cars are the doors and the roof. Every other external metal panel is different and unique to the Rover and the Honda. Now, one of the problems they found with the Rover 800 series, especially selling in America, was the grill didn't have enough presence. So for the 600, they enlarged this front area to give it more, more road presence, more, uh, more character, more, more grrr. Something Willie was keen to do was follow the new trend for organic shapes, which is more aerodynamic in a natural kind of way, which gives these flowing, curvaceous looks. Since the SD1, many cars had followed that kind of wedge style, and they didn't want to be following the crowd. They wanted to go their own way, or it was kind of the new way, in the style of things like the Sierra and the Audi 80, and those kind of more aerodynamic vehicles. And this continues to look modern and very smart. It's aged really well. It's quite a handsome looking car now. One of the stipulations of the Honda way was that the cars had to be powered primarily by Honda engines. So the hard points and the structure was designed for these engines. As a 1.8, a two litre in two power outputs, this is a 131 horsepower two litre, and a 2.3 range topper. And Rover made this work because, you know, it's a good engine. They do have a bit of leakage of oil around the gas, uh, gasket on the cam cover, which they all do that, sir, it's character. But then Rover did manage to re-engineer in a, Rover do seem to do for, because just sheer bloody mindedness, I think. It's like the Rover 75 with a rear wheel drive Mustang engine in it. They went on and put the T-Series turbo from the coupe, um, the Tomcat, which is a 200 horsepower mental turbo car, which is great fun if you can find one of those. And they did the L-Series diesel as well for frugal motoring, ideal for a company car driver. Oh, listen to that leather creak, or it might actually be the seat frame, it's an old Rover. Um, oh, that's astonishingly comfortable. This car, is a GSI. It actually belongs to Mr. Joseph Lloyd of Lloyd's Vehicle Consulting Channel, who has very kindly lent it to me today to have a little play with. If you'd like to have a look at his channel, it's in the link below. Um, so let's talk about Rovers and their interiors. Rover were very good at playing the trim level game. This car came with multiple, multiple trim levels and every version got a little bit of an increment above the rest, to the point, in fact, that the very basic entry level came with plastic bumpers unpainted, which, okay, it looked pretty cheap and nasty. It forced you into the SI, the next level up. So you're spending that little bit more and getting a few more toys for your money to see so you didn't look cheap in the company car park. Having said that, you were never being that cheap because the car started from 13,995 back in 1993. In fact, it launched two months before the Honda equivalent. Every version of the Rover came with electric windows, power steering, a remote central locking, or it is in the infrared initially, an immobilizer and tinted windows. And some of these electric windows do still work. Some do, that one doesn't. If you stumped up for the SI, you got split fold rear seats. Luxurious. And if you specified an SI auto or above, you got a sunroof as standard. Electric, don't you know? If you jumped up to the SLI, got wooden door caps and electric windows in the back. And for this model, the GSI, you got leather. Mmm, nice. Also on the GSI, you got 15 inch alloy wheels, although they do look a bit Nah. If you want the nice alloy wheels, the 16 inches, you want to jump up again to the IS. Now, the interior is pure Rover slash Honda parts bin all the way. And although the seating position is actually quite nice, the seats are very supportive. They've got lots of lumbar adjustment and things to twiddle with, so you can find your perfect place wherever you so desire. 
The steering wheel feels like every other Rover steering wheel I've ever felt from the 90s. Although this is a 1996 car, so post facelift, which means it gets an airbag. The early cars didn't come with one apart from the absolute top of the range car. Again, from the Rover parts bin, these dials are huge and magnificent. They are the brilliant clear dials that I do think are a wonderful piece of design actually. Speedo, Taco, they're, they're big, they're bright, they're clear, they're very legible. And you've got a temperature gauge and a fuel gauge to the left and the right. And a surprisingly large number of warning lights. Because this is the automatic, you've got a auto guide down the center, so showing what gear you're in. Now, as a mid-range car, we do have two blanked off buttons on either side of the binnacle, but below that we've got rear fogs, and we've got a rear heated window. We'd have front fogs and other toys were this not mid-range. We also have a bit of a throwback to the old P6 and P5 days, dimmable instruments. How very pleasant is that? I think it's quite popular in the Japanese market and this is a Honda underneath, so I think that's probably why that's there as well. And uh, dippable angle headlights if you've got heavy loads in the boot. In the center, we've got the same again, Rover parts bin ventilation system. This thing is in every Rover from the 200 up. It works very well. It's actually surprisingly nice and tactile. I think it's probably Honda derived. And this one does have air conditioning, which sadly doesn't work anymore, but it did have air conditioning. So someone did stump up for that. And once upon a time, did have a very nice Rover radio, which is now sadly gone. And below that you have a rather useful little iPhone sized cubby hole. Well, sort of iPhone sized cubby hole and a little flip-up ashtray. I do like a flip-up thing in a dashboard because, because flip-up. This gear shift is pure Honda Accord. It's a big, chunky monster of a thing. And kind of, it looks like leather, but it's kind of rubber, really. So we won't go there. Now here in the center, we've got our electric window switches. Cleverly, Rover have saved a lot of money by putting in the middle so you don't have to have wiring to both doors. On the driver's side, we do have electric mirrors which are also heated as well. It's quite a nice touch. And on the passenger side, you'll find a blanking plate in the same place. So, you know, of left-hand drive cars. But it is a little bit cheap on a car of this kind of market. Compact Executive is going up against E36 BMWs and Audi A4s. Trying to save money here and there. But then we know Rover weren't the richest of people in the world. We do have a nice leather-clad elbow rest here in the center as well with a small cubby underneath. It may have once had a cassette holder on earlier versions, it's just the right size for a few tapes, but uh, this one is just kind of velourishly lined. Now, the back of the car. You can tell it's a compact executive rather than a full-on executive expecting someone to drive you to work because the knee room is rather limited. Um, it's not as bad as an E36 BMW, but it is quite cramped nonetheless. And uh, someone has tried to fix this in the back in keeping with Rovers and Range Rovers of the decade and the decades before the ceiling is falling in. Same as on my Tomcat in fact, that is actually worse than this. But you do have an extra courtesy light for the rear seat passengers and you do have three seat belts. The centre one is only a lap belt but you know two inertia reels either side and nice big pockets for gubbins in the back of the doors and a very large ashtray as well. And also for the rear seat passengers we have the luxury of a big armrest. Not so luxurious for the guy in the middle who's now under an armrest. Also notable on this car is a rear high level brake light. This is kind of the early days of high level brake lights becoming a thing to come as standard from car manufacturers. So uh, well done Rover for a bit of safety. Also in terms of safety and comfort, we have rear headrests, which to be honest are only for safety because the way this roof line dips, you have to put your head back onto it, it's actually quite uncomfortable. Um, because of the organic styling of the car, the way it flows and, and shapes, we do have quite a steeply raked windscreen at the front and again a steeply raked window at the back, so the actual roof area above the passengers is relatively small. So you do have quite a lot of glass over the back of your shoulders, so on a hot day it may be a little uncomfortable for a rear seat passenger. Whatever else you think of this car, the boot spring is quite entertaining. You spring it from beside the driver's seat and then you have quite a big boot actually. Um, in common with saloons of this decade, the boot floor is quite high because there is a full size spare wheel underneath the carpet. So the boot floor is high, although it's quite wide and quite deep and it's a very weird shape. Again, a common thing of 90s Rovers. And uh, in terms of putting big bags and stuff into the back of the car, this lip is quite high. There's always a bit of a tension and argument between the needs of car designers and the needs of car engineers because lowering the lip reduces the rear structural rigidity 
and the engineers don't like that but raising the lip makes it really hard to get stuff in and out and the designers don't like that so you tend to have this compromise with a slightly raised lip which is irritating to everybody also slightly irritating and weird is this dip in the floor um, I suppose maybe if you've got a little bit of loose shopping you've got a couple of wine bottles on the way back from Waitrose um, they will roll into there quite happily and not roll out again if you're not driving too enthusiastically I don't know in it currently is a window regulator because the driver's window has failed and that's a very common thing on these cars you'll notice that although this car is a 620 it's actually badged a 600 pre-facelift cars were badged exactly as they were 618 620 623 wherever you want but post facelift i'm going to think it's either for avoiding badge snobbery in the car park so you could buy a cheaper one and get away pretending it's a more expensive one or more likely for cost saving because it's cheaper to make one 600 badge rather than lots of different little ones um, they changed everything to merely being badge 600. Now this car is monstrously smooth the 131 horsepower 2 litre is just a nice nice unit it, it's a Honda it's going to go on forever apart from the occasional oil leak you're never going to have an issue with it Pricing was a bit weird, Rover never really nailed that position with the car. It was priced similarly to a BMW, but in terms of pitching it was more Mondeo Man. So it was a bit of a, an anachronism, a bit was not quite in the right place for itself. In terms of people who did buy the car, it was a huge hit in the fleet markets, which is where a lot of them did go to. Now although this car was intended to be a replacement for the Montego, when it actually hit the market it was priced quite a way above the Montego so it suddenly found itself in a whole new sector fighting things like the 3 Series and the A4 instead of things like the Mondeo which it had been in intended to pitch against so they wound up having to keep the Montego going far longer than they ever planned to and not killing it after all. Now, although the cars were introduced in 1993 they kept it in production until 1999 when the 75 finally replaced both the 600 and the 800. Now for a long time unfortunately these cars have been kind of forgotten, like the, the forgotten Rover, which is a real shame because really with all the Honda involvement in the engineering and then the Rover involvement in the styling and the suspension, um, it's one of the best Rovers of the last well 20 years and only really the 75 can supplant it in terms of being well engineered and a good drive. Okay, not a good drive, maybe not accurate, it's a, it's a little bit woolly if I'm honest. Maybe in honour of its designer, I don't know. And it's a shame there are very few of these left now because it is rather a nice car and almost certainly going to become a classic. Now let's see what this 2 litre 131 horsepower can do. That's 45, 50, 55, 60. The 0 to 60 time is around 9 seconds officially. It's a little raucous as it gets towards the red line, but it's got plenty of pep and it's quite fun. Possibly more fun than the suspension is willing to play with. What really impressed buyers when they were considering buying this over an E36 for example, was the interior. When you sit in these leather seats in the showroom and you touch the fakish wood, it really does feel like you're in somewhere comfortable, somewhere welcoming and homely. It's got that kind of warm, rosy glow to it that if you climb into a BMW of the same age, well, okay, looking back now, I really like the E36 interior, but at the time, it was very sharp and Germanic and cold. This is friendly and cuddly. It's like a Labrador. Every car came with a free Labrador. This may not be true. I've just been told by the uh, by Mr. Lloyd of Tweed Jackets that the engines in this car are actually built in Japan and then shipped over to Britain where they were fitted in the um, Hondas in Swindon and the Rovers in Cowley. I didn't know that. I seem they'd be assembled here. You live and learn. Thinking of things that are rovery, it's now got dark and started raining so turning on the wipers and the headlights and once again I'm faced with the barrage of Rovers usual switch gear and buttons and things which have a weird way of aging differently in every car I've ever get in. Some of them have felt absolutely immaculate and perfect, others have felt ropey and dangly. This one is weirdly in between. The car's only got 84,000 miles on it. 
but uh, yeah, the switch is the light switch is very very robust. The indicator, oh, it feels alright going one way, not the other. I don't know. I'm rambling now for no reason whatsoever. Sorry. You don't want to hear about light switches, or do you? I don't know. Now on the road, these seats are really supportive and nice, and the steering is actually quite nice and direct. Although I'm not sure it's meant to have progressive steering for low speed extra assistance and high speed extra weight, but it doesn't seem to do that anymore. So at low speed, it's a little bit heavy and at high speed, it's a little bit light. This may be an age related problem rather than a factor of design. Now, I'm not a fan of automatic boxes. I may have mentioned this many times before. In fact, I've definitely mentioned this many times before. But this isn't, isn't too bad. It's quite smooth. It changes relatively slickly. You don't really notice it doing its job in the background because it's not the kind of car you want to be thrashing around in. It's, it's a comfortable cruiser of a car, even with the extra power of the 131 horsepower. If I had the TI version with the two liter turbo, I would absolutely want the manual in it. And the TI also got uprated sports suspension, whereas this is just a little soft but it is extremely comfortable. If I was planning a long trip somewhere, or if I was a, a business driver doing big miles back in the 90s, this car would be very high on my list. If I would not be troubling a chiropractor were I to be doing the M1 a lot in these chairs. The visibility in this car is pretty good, actually. The, um, the A-posts slope back almost to meet you in the eye, so I'm not sure I want to roll it and bang that into my head, but um, you, it's not too fixed. You can actually see quite clearly out of the car without too much trouble. And the windows are nice and big and the B-post is behind your shoulder so you've got nice vision all around you. And also it's nice having, nice having that sunroof. Although rearward visibility is absolutely appalling. It's okay directly behind you in traffic, but when you try and maneuver and reverse the car, you can't see anything of the boot at all. You can just about make it out in the side mirrors, but through the rear, you've no clue at all. So it's a bit of a minefield, and a, it probably explains why there's a clunk taken out of the back bumper on this car. <laughs> also worth noting is the turning circle on this car is not the greatest. It's quite a long car, in fact. It doesn't look massive because the proportions disguise it and all the curves hide the, uh, the shape, the bulk of it. But it is actually quite a big vehicle, really. So when you try and maneuver it into a small space, suddenly it becomes a little bit tricky. This car came with ABS and it works fine, which is quite reassuring. It does have discs all around as well. Well, I hope you've enjoyed another Rover on the channel. I regret nothing. I'm glad I did it. So there. I'm glad I've finally driven a 600 as well, because bizarrely, I've never driven one before. So this is quite a, a bucket list moment for me in many ways. If you've enjoyed it, please hit like, please hit subscribe. And if you've enjoyed it that much, then please do hit share and stick it on Facebook and tell your friends. It would certainly do the, uh, the channel a great deal of, uh, of favor. Uh, join us again next time when who knows what we'll be driving. Thanks again. See you next time.